Welcome to the session on replication. I'm Nicole Jans, uh, as Garrett just said. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I was even more thrilled to be actually in Berkeley in California a while ago, uh, doing something similar. Um, but London is just fine. <laughs> Um, and I'm sure you're enjoying the, um, the weather here. Um, so, first of all, I wasn't here in the morning, but I'm really curious which disciplines you guys are from, okay? So, can you just uh, give me a, a show of hands who here is from politics, IR, or development studies? Uh, including me, by the way. Okay, all right. Um, sociology. Okay. Uh, economics, business. Right. Um, psychology. Okay. Um, other? Okay, so shout out, which are these disciplines? Education. Education, yeah. Statistics. Mm -hmm. Epidemiology. Epidemiology. And indigenous studies. Yep, yeah. okay. Philosophy of science. Oh, fantastic. Any, any other disciplines that I missed? Um, I'm doing engineering, but mm -hmm. I'm under development, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, fantastic. Um, who here? has attempted a replication, so reanalyzing some piece of existing work. Okay, a few. Right. Great. Okay, so, um, in the next uh, one and a half hours, or after the next one and a half hours, every one of you is going to want to do a replication study. Okay, that's my goal. Um, right, so let's get started. Um, first of all, um, just to get back to the roadmap uh, for the summer school here, um, the topics in yellow are what this talk um, is kind of directed at. So failure to replicate, uh, open materials, open data, open code, um, transparent reporting, uh, and reproducible, replicable results. So this, this is where we're at. And just for my background, I'm an assistant professor in international relations um, in Nottingham. I do a lot of stuff about replication. I have led a replication workshop for probably five years now. Um, I've done that mostly at Cambridge, but I'm, uh, I'm taking it with me to Nottingham. Um, and in this workshop, students uh, take a published paper. They have eight weeks to download the data, redo the code, try to replicate, and then publish their study. Um, so the last bit, publishing the study, can take much, much longer than the course, but I get them started uh, with, the, with the workshop. Um, I've written a paper on how to do a replication study, and I'm working with different people. I'm a bit um, catalyst and an OSF ambassador, um, working with different people doing conference panels and things like that to promote transparency in the social sciences. Um, my sub substantive research topics are, at the moment, um, corruption and human rights. Um, I work with a collaborator in Brazil, Dalson Figueiredo, um, on corruption and on court cases about corruption um, in Brazil. There, I know that he sent two students here. Who, who are they? There should be Amanda and Marcus. Hi. hi. Say hi to Dalson, please. So we are working on this, um, and this is a data set that we web scraped, um, or his students web scraped for us. And um, uh, we, we are cleaning it, and it's a, a long, big process. I'm not quite sure how we can be transparent about all that cleaning, because there's a lot of it going on. Um, so that is quite a challenge. And I work with human rights data, so I reuse existing human rights indices, scores from zero to eight, that other people have developed. Uh, and so with my work on human rights, um, it is much easier to be transparent myself. Um, and I do have a study out on human rights and globalization and the replication code, um, the data set, um, some instructions is all online on Dataverse. So feel free to try and replicate it and get in touch um, if, you, if you actually um, if you get the results or if you don't get the results. Um, I write a blog, the Political Science Replication blog, um, with uh, topics around uh, how to replicate and what is going on in the social sciences mostly. And I tweet as well. So this is me in a nutshell. Most scientists can't replicate studies by their peers. This uh, report was about the reproducibility project in cancer, in cancer research. Um, so um, a group of scientists took five landmark cancer research studies and tried to re replicate the results. Um, they could only get the same results for two of the five studies. 
This situation is, uh, happens in different fields, for example in psychology, um, I'm sure the psychologists, uh, psychologists among you have, have seen this, um, there has been a similar project, reproduci a reproducibility project for psychology, where a hundred studies have been tried to be replicated, and only 50% could be replicated, 50% of the results. And the main problem was that often you would still find similar coefficients uh, or a similar kind of um, uh, results, you could get to slight, similar figures, but the one thing that was not replicable as often was um, significance. So in the original studies, 97% had significant results, but the replicators found that not even 40% um, had significant results. So this also speaks to publication bias. We all know why studies um, were presented with significant results to be published, right? You want to get past the re peer reviewers. Right, so many studies are unfortunately not reproducible. Why is that? One of the reasons is that many authors don't share their data and they don't work as transparent as they could. Um, who has heard of the Reinhardt and Rogoff scandal in economics? A few people? Right, so that was in 2013. Um, there was this really prominent paper by Reinhardt and Rogoff, um, a very good and interesting paper, that shows that government debt hinders growth. And so this paper was used by policymakers to say, uh, according to this, we should introduce austerity measures um, in our country so that we have better growth. A student uh, found this study really interesting, and as part of a class assignment, uh, he went ahead and tried to get the data and maybe get the code and try to replicate it, mostly to learn statistics. And the data set wasn't online. So he wrote to the author several times and after a while, because you know everyone is busy, um, he did get the data set, it was an Excel spreadsheet, and he tried to replicate the results and it didn't work out. And so he was trying to find out why, what was wrong with it, did they do their statistics wrong or what was the problem. Essentially what happened was that in the Excel spreadsheet, I think a column or a row moved down just by one or two bits, one or two cells, and that messed up all of the correlations. And so that was a big scandal. This was in, in, in the news um, pretty much everywhere um, because it kind, of, um, it kind of shook our belief in, uh, in economic research. Has anyone heard of the Michael Lacour scandal in political science? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, so this uh, Lacour was a star student at UCLA and he wrote a, a, a really nicely presented study um, in Science, which is a fantastic journal, the best, uh, some would say, um, proving that if you go door-to-door -door campaigning, you can persuade people to be more positive about gay marriage and anti-discrimination policies. So again, um, a team of students wanted to replicate this study and see if they could get to the same results. So they wrote to him and asked him, can you give us your data? Can you show us exactly uh, how everything was done and give us all the details? And he was very reluctant to send any information. And after asking several times, he would then say, oh, the data is confidential. Um, a while later, he would say, oh, I actually deleted the data because they are so sensitive, I, I really don't want to share them. Um, and so that raised a bit of suspicion and the university started investigating and it turned out that all the data were fabricated so that he could get to his nice results and to get into this top journal. That was a big embarrassment for the university, also for his supervisor, he was a PhD student at the time, um, because the supervisor was a co-author on that paper, but he had never seen the data. He had trusted his student that he you know, wouldn't do such a thing. Um, so it was embarrassing for the supervisor um, and Lacour, I think he had had an offer to be an assistant professor at Princeton or some other uh, great university and obviously that was withdrawn and his career was basically um, kaput. So um, that's not great, right? So another issue uh, that leads to irreproducibility is that a lot of journals don't require data upload. This is slowly changing, but is, this is still the case in many disciplines. For example, in political science, there has been a study that's from 2013, 
um, and it showed that among 120 political science journals, top journals, only 18 had a replication policy. So only 18 journals out of 120 would ask their authors to upload the data, upload the code, and be transparent about what they have done. This has now slowly changed. The scandals usually help uh, to bring about change. Um, but it's still not, very, not that great. So what I've done with a co-author, Nils Peter Gledic, um, we've edited a symposium about reproducibility in international relations. And we went to the top journals in the field who now have replication policies after all those scandals and looked in the repository if the data are actually there. And we found that even if the author writes in a footnote, oh, the data can be found in the journal archive or this URL will give you the data and the code, oftentimes it would not be there. And that shows that the editors don't, really, don't always enforce their own replication policy. So um, it's still not looking, uh, not looking great. So most scientific knowledge we trust remains unchecked. And um, there are some solutions, of course. Um, the most obvious one is probably journals, right? They have big leverage. Everyone needs to get published. So if journals uh, adopted better and stricter replication policies, like um, the, maybe according to the TOP guidelines here, um, this could really help. Because if you don't get published, unless you upload your data, that is a good incentive, right? Um, journals should obviously also follow through and enforce these, these policies. Another solution is funders. And again, if you want to get the grant and uh, the funder says you have to be transparent and you have to make everything transparent afterwards, um, this, this is going to make you do it, right? So the National Science Foundation and also the Research Councils UK are not too bad. They all require data management plans. So before you, when you uh, submit a grant, you usually have to say in which way you're going to share your data. And if you think you sh cannot share your data, maybe they are sensitive or personal, why that, why that is the case and which part of those data you might still be able to publish. Um, so they have a lot of leverage as well. But getting closer to my topic of replication, all of this doesn't help if there isn't anyone taking these data and double checking the studies, right? Otherwise, you have great transparency, but you no know, one will ever invest time to, um, to look at, uh, at the studies and see if they are correct or not or what you can improve. So we need more replicators. Um, replicating, for those of you who have, who have done replications already, you know it can be frustrating and time consuming. So why should you do it? I mean, those of you who have done it, obviously you had your reasons. Um, why should you replicate? There we go. Um, the first reason is it's one of the best ways to learn statistics. Just a sec. It's one of the best ways to learn statistics. Um, I've taught statistics courses using textbooks, and I've also taught statistics using replication. So asking a student, take this table from this paper and try to replicate it with, say, the logistic regression we just learned. And all the students, without exception, have said that learning statistics through replication is much more painful because you get lots of bugs and, 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 and challenges, but you really learn it properly. You work with real life data, you get to know why authors made certain decisions because you can see, oh, I could run my regression this way or that way. The paper did it that way. This way, it wasn't significant. Now I understand why the author went that way. There are a lot of things that you will learn about a paper that looks very polished um, when, it's, you know, when you download the PDF. Um, and you learn statistics and how to, um, how to and how not to do statistics um, quite well. Um, and it can be more fun than, than a textbook ex example, because textbook examples always work. So what's the fun in that? Was there a question? Oh, just to make sure, uh, are you using replication same way as repro I mean, reproducibility. I mean, are there the same things in the context of the presentation? Because sometimes mm -hmm. I get a bit confused. Yeah. I've just read a paper where saying that mm -hmm. there are different things. So. Yeah. Okay, so I'll talk about how to define replication in a second. But I sh uh, what I want to say now is 
Replication means to reanalyze an existing piece of work and see if you can get to the same results, in a nutshell. nutshell. Reproducibility for me means that I work transparently, so that I work in a way that others can see the data, see the code and reproduce it. But I'll get to a few more um, in just a second. And kind of, it's already here. So usually when you replicate, you can see very quickly when a, a study that from the outside looks like the author has been very transparent, when a study is really reproducible and transparent and when it is not. Because often you, get, you download the code, you think, oh, fantastic, I'll just run this data code or I'll just run the R code and then nothing works. So this is, for my students, this is usually a really painful way to see when, uh, when you think you've been, you've been working transparently, but really you haven't. Um, and so for the students that have worked with me in these workshops that I've, that I've run, after they've done the workshop, they approached their own work and their own files and com uh, codes and everything in a much more um, meticulous way. So they, they kind of uh, created a reproducibility routine that is much more efficient. And then finally, uh, when you replicate, and when you replicate plus you add knowledge, let's say by adding a new variable, improving the models, adding on to the theory, so not just verifying what the other person did, but actually adding more stuff to it, you can write a whole new paper and get it published. And among the students that I had in the past, not everyone gets it published because that is a whole other time-consuming uh, thing that you're doing, but it is possible. I have six, seven students where their fir the first paper in their career was a replica, like a kind of, um, like an improved replication study. And that is just fantastic for them to get that out of, uh, out of a replication exercise. Excuse me. Yeah. When you are replicating an existing study, mm -hmm. are you using the same um, technique or different technique? Very good question. I'm going to get to that. So the question was when you have a replication, when you do a replication study, do you use the same data and methods or not? Right? Yeah. So that'll, that'll come in a, in a second. So how to replicate? I'm going to, this is just the outline, I'm going to go through five challenges, which are kind of a guideline of how to do a replication study. Uh, first of all, and that speaks to the question earlier, there are a lot of definitions of replication, and sometimes they differ across fields. Um, it's very hard to pick the right article, because some articles are better suited for that than others, and sometimes the match between you and the article can be good or bad, depending on your statistics knowledge. Um, it's important to know how to replicate systematically because there are so many results within one paper. You kind of really have to stay, stay focused on those and stay on course. Um, it can be a challenge to get a replication study published because it doesn't count as original research. So there are ways to make it like that. And I'll talk about that as well. And then challenge five is, so when you're a replicator, you also get vulnerable because you are checking someone else's work and obviously, some, a third person or the original author could say, well, you know, I could question what you were doing. So you have to be super careful and be very transparent in what exactly you've done. So you have to work reproducibly yourself. And I'm going to go through the five challenges now. So, many definitions, and I know that in all the different fields, um, people use different words. I'm going to say what I'm going to use today, just so that we, you know when I talk about replication what I mean, right? So there's replication, reanalysis, external replication, reproduction, conceptual replication, all these different terms. And basically the main tip for you is use whatever the terminology is in your field. Uh, and that's the students that I had in my workshops are from all, all kinds of different disciplines. And so they wrote very different class assignments for that reason, uh, using different language. So in political science, uh, that is something that I'll work with today. A duplication would be verifying the research results of the study. So you would use the same data and the same methods, right? So this is kind of the easy, the easier version. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's the easier version because uh, you will hopefully be able to download the data, or maybe you can get, you can collect those data again from, say, the World Bank, and you will try and use exactly the same models. 
and you would be surprised how often you actually, even though you're doing exactly the same stuff, you still don't get the same results. So this is to verify what previous work has done. And the proper full replication within the world of political science would be to test the robustness of the original research uh, results. And here you would collect new data. Often you can measure, say, democracy or human rights in slightly different ways, right? Um, and you would try and apply improved models. And not just for the sake of it, but often you can apply five different models. Um, and you want to make sure that the best model was used for the data. So this is what we would call a full replication. So um, in reference to the paper that he mentioned, which I also read, um, so where does um, studies which use the same analysis but different data fit into what you're going to talk about? Or does it not fit in at all? Probably here. So if you use the same models, say um, panel corrected standard errors for cross-section time series, but you use different data, maybe a, diff an, a newer measurement for human rights, you are already testing the robustness. If you, if you are lucky enough that the author has uploaded their data set um, and you download that data set and run the same code, you are basically mostly just checking if, this, if they did their work, if they did, if, yeah, if they did their work right. Okay. So how, sorry, just because mm -hmm. I want to understand it before we go into the whole talk. So how does using different, com like completely different models with completely different data, how does that test the robustness of previous research? Mm -hmm. Because you still, you would still test the same hypothesis. Say, globalization is bad for human rights. Um, or foreign direct investment inflow is bad for human rights protection. There are different ways to measure foreign direct investment. You can, you know, take the log, you can divide it by GDP, you can take FDI stock or, or uh, flow, and there are different ways to measure that. And there are also different m ways to measure human rights um, protection. Some measure it more in terms of um, worker rights or in terms of what is a more democratic country. There are different indices out there. But if your hypothesis is still uh, globalization is bad for human rights, but you're now using different data, you have addressed that kind of original research question, and you're testing if, if the um, answer that they have is really robust, robust to using slightly different uh, models or, or data. I mean, a really, really, really good paper would have a ro robustness section within it using different measures and slightly different models to show what are the limits of their study and how the you know how volatile and how fragile the results are and so pretty much all papers have that but often what you see what you see presented as robustness check still gives you the same results because that is just very convenient and maybe they ran some other robustness tests and then just didn't include that and so that would then be your job okay so in psychology um, and I'm sure the psychologists among you, have, you who have read the rich literature more deeply, um, that you might have even more and different um, kind of ways of talking about it. Um, one way I've seen uh, was close replication versus conceptual replication, and it's a parallel story. Close replication would verify the results and trying to stay very close. You can't always have the exact same data because maybe you have to rerun an experiment or do a survey again, but you try and stay very close. And a conceptual replication, um, in this case, would be, again, to, tr to test the robustness of that theory or the hypothesis. So the story is pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to add a little bit of a note to that. Mm -hmm. also, oh, perfect. Um, so I think um, it's important to have this distinction uh, first to, to be able to uh, get the same results with the same data, so what you did already. And then you, of course, have this, this replication. And then I think, uh, so I, I wouldn't say that this close replication is only related to the duplication, because it, especially in psychology, it is important to have more of those close replications and not only the conceptual replications. I mean, conceptual replications will say something about the robustness of the uh, results, of course, but it also makes it more possible to, uh, to use. Uh, Replication bias and only select the good results. So therefore, we really need also those close replications by using the same methods but, uh, uh, on a different data set. So 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, thank you. And so, depending on which field you're in, um, people might be more keen on checking the existing results or adding on to it and doing and, and checking the robustness of a certain research um, question and hypothesis. Um, that is something you kind of need to figure out for your field. And again, when you write up your study, there are different ways to sell your replication to get it published. Um, I'll talk about that later, but in political science, um, until probably more recently, you wouldn't have said uh, in your title that this is a replication study. You would have just given it a title and mentioned somewhere that you are on the go, you are replicating what the authors have done before, but you, and then you make a whole other story of what you have added on. And that is a matter of, rep of presentation to get it published. And that also depends on your field. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. What's, um, ben, what is the difference between replicating a system study and justifying your own study? Or sometimes when we want to carry out the study, we justify it. Perhaps um, previous, previous studies didn't look at particular direction or we use the particular methodology that we suspect is an adequate that you want to work on. So what's the difference between the two? Replicating and then justifying your own study based on existing studies. Perhaps yeah. you are using more detailed data. Or okay. So the question is what is the difference between replicating a study and adding on stuff mm -hmm. and justifying why you do your own study in a certain way? Because you often, you always refer to existing an existing body of work and you always say, oh, previous studies can be criticized methodologically or theoretically in these, these, these ways. So. It's very similar. Often it's just the way of how you present what you've done. I think if you do an actual replication of a previous paper, um, you don't just refer to it in your literature review, but you have actually downloaded the code and tried to rerun the models, and you had an actual interest in that particular paper, um, at building off of this particular paper. And in general, most papers that we all know build on an existing body of work, but they may not pick this one particular paper that they want to criticize. They may say that in the field there has been an issue with this and that, and then they kind of, they may not actually present any tables showing how they replicated something. But you're right, it's very closely related, because we all build off, uh, we build on existing, existing work. It's just a matter of how deeply you engage with that existing work. Or maybe you have engaged very deeply, but you're not presenting that in your paper because you feel you don't have space for that. So there's a, um, this is just a pointer. If, uh, I don't maybe some people have already read this paper by Clemens. Um, he has a very nice uh, paper about all the different ways of how in the different fields replication and all the different other terms are defined. And um, I know this is too small for you uh, to read off the screen. This is just to, for you to know when you download the slides later that this is where you can look it up. So basically here you can see political science, sociology, psychology, business. And he looked at all these different studies and how they talk about replication and what kind of language they used. So this is just for you to know that you can get a bit more into it um, by looking at this paper. Right, so how do you pick a good article to replicate? Say you are persuaded that this is something you want to do. Um, the perfect replication project is, uh, obviously it's, it has to be a paper that is relevant and important. It has impact, it's so otherwise no one's going to be interested in it. Um, the results, sometimes the results are widely accepted, but maybe it, they haven't been checked before. Um, Especially if you work in a field that is very closely related to a particular article, you may already know that there are control variables that should really be there, and so you come across this paper and you think, why haven't they included um, education as a factor? And so this is something, if you, if you are already a little bit engaged with that topic, that would be a good paper for you to pick, because there you already know that if you add those variables, you can be pretty sure that the results might change, and then you can engage with that and, and write a paper about that. And sometimes you have, um, yeah, you have um, outdated measures. So, f for example, in human rights, there is uh, a relatively new measure now that corrects old measures that create a bias. But most of the literature of the last 30 years has used these older measures simply because 
everyone has agreed that these are the ones to use. And so when a new measure comes out, that is a very nice way of saying, okay, why don't I take um, a few studies that are landmark studies in my field, but try the new measure and then see what changes, and then you can engage with that and write a paper about that. There is a book, I forgot the title, but there's a book about replication in linguistics, because I know there was one person in linguistics. Um, I forgot the title, but it says something about linguistics and replication. You'd have to look it up. And the author says, sometimes a particular research topic is ripe for replication. Um, so where a lot of people keep saying the same thing, they all agree, it all sounds great, but maybe you feel there's something missing, and that could be something um, where you can pick a study or a group of studies to replicate. So an example of a good pick, I mean, it's easy for me to say that now that we know the, uh, there was the scandal, but the Reinhard Rogoff paper uh, that was chosen by the student who tried to replicate it, um, it was highly influential, it, has a, it had a very clear argument, it was in a high journal, and it had huge impact on actual policy. So that is something that will make it very interesting for you um, as a replication po uh, project. Uh, Matthew Zalganik from Princeton uh, in sociology uh, runs similar courses. He assigns replications um, as class projects. And he said that by far the biggest problem that frustrated students and stopped them from uh, kind of successfully um, getting the assignments done was they picked papers that were too difficult given their background. So you, you really have to select a study where you feel like you can learn that method within a reasonable amount of time. Um, I had some students in my classes who had up to that point only done bivariate correlation tests. So I'm sure they could get to regression, but if you then go into time series and panel data and you have only two, three weeks, um, that just wouldn't work out. So I personally, I've also replicated a lot, mostly to learn what's going on in certain fields. Um, and I try to pick studies um, where I can understand the statistics and learn it, and, and otherwise I cannot really engage with it. Um, this is not very strict, but if the study is a bit too old and not from a good journal, then again, people might not be interested in it. They might not be, you know, even if it doesn't replicate, maybe people would just say, who cares? Um, and ideally, but this is often not the case, ideally, the data and even the software code would be available because then you can do a duplication fairly quickly and then you can do the interesting bit which is um, adding on, adding on new variables, changing the models, changing the time frame, maybe running another survey or something like that. So there are studies out there where this is given and so this will make it much, much more appealing and much faster. So how do we replicate systematically? Um, ideally, you'd have a project plan. I, I maybe could have even called this pre-analysis plan because kind of these are things um, that you want to take into account before you actually start. Um, so you need to have an idea of what the actual results are that you want to replicate. Um, you need a list of the statistical models um, that you may have to learn. Um, you need to get a good idea of if the data are available, if you have access to the data, where exactly are the data, have you actually downloaded the data, and can you actually open the data set with your software. That sounds like very banal, but in, in my classes I've had students who said in the f f you know second or third week, I have everything ready, and then we sat on their computers, and then it turned out, oh, that code is written in the software that I don't actually have on my computer, or uh, the data were actually not under the URL, they were just not there. And so this is something to really double check before you kind of put more time into this. Um, is the soft software code online? And then often when you start out, you already have a bit of an idea of how this, stu uh, how this study or the paper could be extended, maybe from your own research. Uh, maybe you have some ideas of data and methods Maybe you usually work with logistic regression and you just know that this outcome variable, you, if you turn it into a binary or you turn it into, um, you use an, a different way of dealing with the order of that variable or the, the rank order, maybe you already know that you can use this other model on, on the data set. And that's something to really write down and have ready as a plan for yourself. So what my students have done 
they basically took a Word document and copied all the copy pasted screenshots of all tables and figures, and then they went through it bit by bit. And again, it sounds very banal, but when you're in the middle of a re big replication project, you have like hundreds of lines of code, you may not remember anymore which table it was that you were supposed to replicate. And so these kind of little th tricks really help to keep going. And as an overview, what the steps are is you select a paper. We've talked about that. You try to access data and code. If it's not possible, I personally would pick a different paper. But if you're really keen, you can try and recollect those data. Often these are data sets that are online. Uh, in, in, in some in some ways at the World Bank or somewhere else. Identify each variable. Often there's no code book and the variables have really funny names and you just don't know which those are. You don't know which went into the model in which way. It's, it, this can be a real, real nightmare. You would then try to reproduce the tables and figures. So this is um, following very closely to the paper. Yep. Set data and code. I think to do the replication you are talking about, you need to also use the same data source. Especially for some of us working on um, macroeconomic data, because sometimes you realize that you given this yes, so that you can just afford to say that this is Nigerian GDP, maybe from World Bank or from IMF, or data. so yeah. you could have different results. Yeah. So the point was um, to try and get the data from the same source. Most papers say it's from the World Bank uh, or the, the, the IMF or some other source, particularly if you work in economics, right? So try to get them from, from the same source if, if you don't get the original data set. And ideally, if the paper tells you that, try to get it in the same version because often these, paper, these data are revised a year later or corrected. Maybe missing data points are changed. So already in that, it can happen that you cannot reproduce the results because simply they have improved how they um, you know, produce their data. So if you try and get it from this, the same version of the data, that would be ideal. But it's not always practical. You know, practically, it may not always be possible, for sure. So once you've done that, you compare. This is what I, these are my results. These are the results of the paper. And then you can see what worked and what didn't work. And um, yeah, so this is, um, if you have help and you do it with someone else or you have help in your lab with, from your supervisor or you do a class where you have, you know, a t on your tutorials or something, this can still take four weeks. Um, if you're completely on your own, this, this could take longer. Um, and this is what, in, in my world, I would call a duplication or verification of this particular study. But you want to add value because this is how you can then try and get published, right? So new data, we talked about it before, new variables, different model specifications, or even theoretical contributions. So it could be that the author applied a certain theory in a way that you think should be done differently. Um, again, you would compare the results. And I'm, usually, you would probably get something different. Because if you work with different data and different models, depending on what kind of data you work with, it's not uncommon to have different results. But you would then say, is that a problem? Does that completely invalidate the original study? Or is it just that we have learned something really new from what I've done now? And so when that is the case, uh, it is much more likely that you can get published. So the obvious steps are, you know, get feedback, try to submit it at a journal, um, you know, um, present at a conference, and things like that. So this can, um, this can take months, as with many papers that, you know, a paper, when you write a paper, this is, this is how it is, right? It just takes a long time. And so that would be um, a full replication. Now, how can you add value? That really depends on your fields, but one would be a theoretical contribution, so questioning even the arguments. But among the different statistical contributions that my students have used are the typical kind of, the typical culprits are sample size, using different years, do, using different countries. Um, so you can add values by, for example, there are a lot of studies that don't even do power calculations. Um, and if you're in psychology, you would think like, how could this ever happen? But in politics, for example, 
A lot of papers just use whatever data are there, and if the sample is small, then the sample is small. You can't produce more countries if they aren't there, right? Um, so, um, yeah, you can create different subsets of your data. Um, often in politics we say maybe we do developing countries versus all countries or versus industrialized countries to see if the effects are different. Um, or you maybe you want to handle missing data differently. That's a, that's a nice one, actually, if you can do multiple imputation or if you have a good way of dealing with missing data. You can really add value to a study. Obviously, model specification. In political science, often the question is, do you add fixed effects or not? Maybe that is something that people do in your field as well. Um, changing measurements. <laughs> when you work with human rights and globalization, as I do, when you do something divided by GDP, or you take the log, this can already change things drastically. Um, and so, depending on your field, again, this is something you may want to check out and really think about why did something change, why did the results change based on that. Yeah, and different, um, different robustness checks, um, how sensitive are the data to small changes. So this is just an overview of different things that my students have done to add value to their replication, or to the, to the duplication, and to, to then get it published. When you want to compare your results with the original study, you have to be a bit careful. So you have to be very precise what exactly you did, what are all the steps, because you can't just go there and say, oh, this study doesn't replicate, this is a mis this is scientific misconduct, this author is rubbish, um, and I'm gonna, you know, um, I'm gonna correct everything. Um, this is not the way to go about it because you're going to piss off all the people that might give you jobs later or give you grants later and so on, right? So you have to be very clear and very neutral in, in your language. Um, and it's not just me saying that, it's Gary King from Harvard University saying that and so he is always right. Um, the political scientists know what I'm talking about. He, he's um, uh, well known for pushing for replication. Um, so a replication can fail at different stages, and you have to be very clear when that was the case. So if you use the exact same data and the same code or the same methods, um, that is really a problem. If you, if, if even if, so that kind of means that the author must have been incompetent, because if you run the same code on the same data and you get a different result, maybe he uploaded the wrong code or the wrong data, you don't really know what it is, but that, that would not give me a lot of trust in that study. Um, if you have added on knowledge, obviously you have to be very clear why you added a new variable. So don't just play around. That would be p-hacking again, or, or just basically data massaging, right? So be very clear why you have made certain changes. Maybe another measurement is really so much better. Um, and you have to be very clear how that then changed the results. So you have, Kind of, you have to justify quite a lot why you think the original study um, cannot be replicated. Um, because naturally, um, and this has happened in my field, someone uh, did a study on globalization and human rights. A few years later, someone else said, oh, it's completely the other way around. The effect is not positive, but negative, And I've used a different measure. And then the original author went back and said, yes, but you have used a different measure. I'm not surprised you're getting a different results. So again, you have to justify um, why you think that this, um, this result is different and what that means for the trustworthiness of the original study. And so this is a checklist. I don't want to read out all of this, but this is, um, yeah, I, I saw that just a sec. Um, the most important bit is really to say exactly how, if you're working in the frequentist framework, um, but ev even, you know, in any framework, um, how the coefficients change, the standard errors, the confidence, confidence intervals, how, because this is the big thing that everyone is looking at. Is it still significant or not? Okay, we can talk about if that's a good thing in general, but this is what people are going to be interested in. Um, but you really have to talk about how you transform variables, um, what was unclear in the original study. So really, really be, um, be very clear on this. Now this is the fun bit. Um, Try to be professional, and I'll show you people who are maybe not as professional. Communicating failed replications. Oh, sorry, there was a question earlier. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I just wanted to ask if you recommend engaging with the original authors when you're having problems mm -hmm. with 
Has anyone who did a replication written to the original author? I know there are a few people, yeah? You have? Yeah, and what, did you feel it was uh, it was a good idea to do that, or did, were they pissed off? <laughs> okay. Okay, so the author was critical that you, as students, were asked to do yeah, a replication. Okay. Yeah. So this is an example from Brazil where the authors were not happy that anyone even asks them for their data. They would feel like. I'm untouchable. Why would you yeah, do that? They say, yeah. Uh, uh, can do this. You ah, so students are amateurs. They yeah, shouldn't be doing that, yeah, right? Why are uh, why are taxing why this? These are, these are private. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Okay, so these are my private data. Why are you asking me for this? Okay. Any other experiences with original authors? Yeah. So getting no answer. That's also a way of engaging. Did you also make that have that experience? Yeah. So not getting an answer, yeah. So, um, me. yeah. Sometimes um, those data are purchased, and when you have the author, you say, no, I can make it available because I bought it at a very expensive price. So <laughs> you need it, yeah. you pay, and then, yeah. Some uh, authors say that these data have, or creating this data has cost money. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You are, you are even <clears throat> going to the extent of common in Africa where maybe you have a paper, mm -hmm. if you want you to read the article, I mean read, mm -hmm. then you write to the author, the input, you will answer. So replication is, is another level. Okay. <laughs> okay, so for those who didn't get that, he, uh, he said that in, in Africa often you cannot even get access to the paper. The author wouldn't even send you the paper to read the PDF. <laughs> so replication is a whole other level. Yeah, okay. Um, so the original question was, should you contact the, the author? And uh, I personally would do it. I think it's, um, it's a nice thing to do that, um, to say, well, okay, so different, there are different kind of um, situations. One situation is the data aren't there, right? The data aren't in any repository. Obviously, if you are really keen on that, you do have to write to the author and ask for the data. If you ask really nicely, um, and tell them, oh, this is, this is not to criticize you, this is for me to learn statistics, this is my class assignment, um, I, re I really want to work off this study and build on this study, and I'd be super interested in your input. Um, and nice, really nice things, non-confrontational non and professional. And professional. Um, then I've had it that people sent me their data, so I've been successful in that. I've been less successful when I was still a PhD student. I've been more successful when I had an prof uh, assistant professor in my signature. <laughs> Not surprisingly, right? Um, also, sometimes my students, so my, my students would usually ask me, so how should I write my email? And I had a template and I said, maybe use that template and write your name under it and so, so that it looks kind of friendly. Um, some students never got an answer and they had to pick another study. Some students actually dropped out of my class because they just could, they wrote, that was in economics. I had a student three years ago who wrote to uh, 10 different authors in economics trying to get their data and they were so secretive that she just said, I, I'm halfway into the class, I, I just don't know what to do. Um, so she dropped out. Um, I'm sure the situation has changed now uh, because the trend is to be, to, to be, to share more. But, um, be professional, be friendly. I think it's fine to write to the authors. I would probably not promise them something like um, co-authorship or that they can double check what you've done. I think that would go a bit too far because you wouldn't be independent as a replicator anymore. But it can sometimes happen that you, it develops into a relationship where you actually end up writing a new paper together that is not really replication anymore, but you've kind of opened the door to being, uh, being um, a person that you know, they engage with. Um, but I can totally see, um, I've collected, <laughs> for a different version of this talk, I have collected answers from authors who never replied or who never gave me their data. And the excuses were usually, I'm traveling, I don't have the files with me, I don't have my hard drive with me, um, my co-author has the data, so I asked the co-author, my co-author has the data, no, the other one has the data. Um, the data is on the journal archive, where it wasn't, 
or basically you, they say, yes, I'll send it to you next week, and then half a year later, oh, I was busy, sorry, I couldn't, I'll send it to you next week. So these things happen. Um, I, I don't always think, I actually don't think that this is, that these people are being bad people that are hiding anything. I think they're just busy and preparing data for you to look at takes time and probably they haven't, so if they had uploaded them when they published the paper, their life would be easier too because they wouldn't have this nagging, right? So, yeah, I would, I personally would contact the author, but it's not a must. You can totally download the data, work with it. It would be, I think, I think it would be nice for you once you've written your replication to write to them and say, I have replicated your paper, some things didn't work out. I'd be curious to see what you think about that in terms of maybe I did something wrong in my replication attempt. Um, that would give them the chance to comment on it and work with you. But again, you, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. So let me just re repeat that for, for, for those who are sitting in the back. Um, so you can reduce an author's anxiety by being very clear what exactly you, it is that you want to do with your data and what your goal is, right? Because then they know a little bit more about what it is that you're actually trying to do and they might feel less, oh, the replication bullies are after me, okay? <laughs> So that's the one point. That's a very good point. Yeah, for sure. And exactly. so that brings up this second issue. Are we expected to pre-register replication? Say again, pre-register replication. Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yes, of course. <laughs> no, I mean, I actually, I haven't thought about it. I think so. When I said earlier, you have to have a project plan and you know what you want to do. This is something you could put online as a as a pre-registered project, right? And so. Do you remember the slides in the beginning, the reproducibility project cancer research, reproducibility um, project psychology? So they have uh, pages on the Open Science Framework, OSF, where they said exactly how they are conducting their huge replication projects. So, so that everyone who later want, you know, wants to check, oh, the studies didn't replicate, what does that mean, can go and have a look. So it is actually a really good idea. Right? Because if someone later says, oh, you just want to bully me, you can say, well, I've clearly laid out the things I want to do, and this is what I've done, and so you're being super transparent and, and open and, and, and neutral, and, you know, um, I think this is a good idea. <coughs> yep? So, um, especially with uh, micro-studies, using micro-household uh, level data sets, I realize that sometimes country dynamics, norms, all affects the extent and even the, the direction of, 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 of uh, effects. So for instance, somebody conducted a study in Brazil. I asked the person to give me his piece, then we replicate in back, I replicate, and uh, maybe I find out I find out that wage rather increases and uh, reduces maybe our spent on uh, mm -hmm. uh, paid work. And, and I, I jumped to the conclusion that okay I got a counter, counter a different result from yours. So it means that maybe we have to go beyond uh, what is actually happening in, uh, in the data because there are a lot of issues that may influence what you get. Yeah. So that's a very good point. Um, uh, I'll summarize it. Uh, the main idea is that you always have to consider the context 
if you rerun the same uh, study or say you, you replicate a study in a different, in a slightly different context, in a different country context, even a different time context, um, you may get different results simply because of that. And so you have to really communicate that and discuss it in your in your replication paper that you are writing. Um, that would be the professional thing to do. Otherwise, it's kind, it would be kind of embarrassing because yes, if you change things, there may be different results. It's, that is not the interesting bit. The interesting bit is why is that and what can we learn from that about different country contexts, for example. Yeah, very good point. Okay, so uh, we have kind of talked about this already. I'm just giving you a few examples. Replicators, uh, this is a replication study, have written things like this. We find that coding errors, selective exclusion of available data, and unconventional weighting of summary statistics led to serious errors. So uh, this was the, um, he, um, Herndon, um, criticized the Reinhard Rogoff paper, and this is how he wrote it. So I think this is um, clear, but not unprofessional. This is not getting personal, right? Um, another, um, replication study wrote, if we cannot even, so this is a bit more, <laughs> if we cannot even reproduce the original results using the same publicly available data, there is no need for further commentary. So this is, this is like a stronger comment, right? So they said basically if you try duplication and e that already doesn't work out, you know, no need for further comment. Uh, that was, these are Miller, um, I forgot the second author's name, uh, these were students who rep tried to replicate a study um, in international relations um, as a class project and then got their replication study published. Um, and they wrote a blog post about it on my blog. So, original authors often respond publicly to you being the replicator. Um, so, and uh, they, depending on how um, how personally offended they are, this can, you know, this can go different ways. So, for example, uh, Mansfield, Milner, and Rosendorf were replicated by another study in the past, and, um, yeah? Just a question. Do we have special journals publishing replication papers? Uh, I'll get to that. The question is, are there journals that publish replications, or specific journals? And I'll, I'll get to publication. Yeah, good point. So, they would say, the replication study of my, of my original work is less realistic, inconsistent with the substantive literature and of limited utility. So this could happen to you, that someone says that. Or they would say the study was fundamentally flawed. Or statistical, computational and reporting errors invalidate its conclusions. So sometimes authors would respond back and can be quite harsh because obviously you have questioned their work. So this is just something to be aware of. Um, on my blog, I collect something that I call replication chains. When you have a, an original study, the next chain would be it being replicated, and then the author answers, the original author answers, and then maybe the replicator answers. And that, So I collect these because I find it interesting how they engage with each other and how they talk to each other. Challenge for publishing a replication study. This is the biggest challenge, but also this is the part where it can get really rewarding. So, good replication studies get published. Um, I would recommend to write, as obviously that is always recommended, write a solid paper and start with this is the puzzle, this is the relevance, the hypothesis, research design, findings, discussion. This is how you usually write a paper when you, in the quantitative context, right? So, don't approach it as in this is the original study and then this is how I try to replicate it. No one wants to read that. That's very boring. That's more like a report in a student assignment for class, mm -hmm. but you have to rewrite it as if it was a new paper. Uh, and think of it as an original piece and not a replication. In some fields, I would not mention the word replication in the title. Depending on how open the, f the journals are to replication studies, um, you may be able to just say that, which I think would be ideal because, you know, we can be honest, but sometimes you wouldn't do that. So in political science, um, Usually what happens, people would say something like, our approach builds off of the methodology and data used by Gomez et al. 2007, adding measures of this and that. So this is clearly 
a replication study which has added value and they are selling it as a completely new paper. And that's, that's a good way to, to go about it because that's how you can get past the review stage. Okay? Or this is the Miller paper, Bell and Miller actually. I think that's the one that I talked about. Um, we analyze a diet year data set used by Rauchhaus 2009, right? So this is a replication. Um, and we did some improvements. But they don't call it replication study, they give it a proper title, a catchy title, for, like it, for a journal article. Or this one here, I revisit these important questions by highlighting problematic aspects of the analysis by this paper. So again, nowhere in the title can you see replication. So I kind of found out about this by accident because I was looking for replication studies in my field so I can show my students, hey, it's possible to publish replication studies. And I went on Google Scholar and looked for replication political science and put in some, some topics and I had a hard time finding them. And then when I looked a bit closer, I, found, I did find those studies, but not under the buzzword replication, but maybe reanalysis, revisit. So that's how I kind of found out that people have different ways of selling their papers. But in uh, economics, clearly there's replication in the title, and it's absolutely fine. So the, the, the tip is really to look how people are publishing replications or replication type studies in your field and emulate what it is that they do. So we had two questions. Yeah? Um, I think it's really interesting to look at how you can get them published in your field, but I wonder, is it not a bit of a problem that, you know, the word replication is not helpful in selling and studies? Yeah. Because you wanted to find replications and you couldn't find them because we weren't allowed to say replication. So if I want to do a study and find out the literature, especially in psychology, where the, the, clo the close replications are important, and I actually need to use that word, really. Do you think that's a problem? People are nodding, yeah, so it is a problem, right. So in an ideal world, people would just be upfront, I've done a replication study, I've added value, I've done good work here, I think this should be published, because, you know, we need, to, we, this is how you build knowledge. Right, so it shouldn't be that you have to sell your paper, paper in a different way. The reason why I pointed this out is um, because I wanted my students to get motivated and to be able to publish their replication study. Ideally, it wouldn't be the case. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Arno? Um, in some disciplines, you've got to explain in the abstract or a the paper which is, what is your, the primary objective of your paper, what is the secondary So what would you say in this particular case, if you had to pick a primary objective, would you say that it's the replication or would you say that it's the extra bit, what you added? Yeah, so, you have to mm -hmm. so in an abstract where you have to identify what is the primary and the secondary goal of your paper, to be practical and get through the peer review process, I would say primarily I wanted to work on this topic and add on to this body of knowledge by looking at this hypothesis and as secondary, I would say, I am also replicating, and then you say whichever study it was. So this is obviously your choice, and depending on how advanced your field is in accepting replications, you may do it exactly the other way around. Um, but in political science, I would do it that way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, for, for instance, if you have a, a good when you replicate, you have uh, the same result. Mm -hmm. Me meaning that you, you, you follow the good rules. Mm -hmm. Then someone will ask, what is the value no, 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 no. addition of, mm -hmm. of that? Yeah. What, what you mean? Mm -hmm. So you basically did what somebody did. So what are you, mm -hmm. what are you adding? So the question is, what is the advice when you, when you had a successful replication? Right? In an ideal world, you would be able to publish that because you would confirm something, and it is good to know that certain things can be confirmed. Um, I think you would have a hard time saying, I replicated the study, everything replicated perfectly, end of story. My advice would be to add knowledge still. And there's always, there's always a way to add knowledge. And actually, I would probably take that as, 
your own private little exercise, but then really, obviously, when you go through the replication process, I'm sure on the go you have ideas, oh, I could change this, I could look at this, right? Um, without wanting to question that author, but just it's inspiration that you get from that study. So you could actually um, write a whole new study using that data set, because that's the, often you use secondary data, um, and write your own paper by changing things, adding things, and then sell it as an original piece of work. You can then mention that you did replicate and you confirmed those findings, but you found that um, you know, the argument could be brought further, or you can just not say that and you know, pretend that this was just an exercise for yourself to get inspired. But um, that doesn't mean that this is the end of the story. So it's not so much. Sometimes I went to, uh, to conferences and, oh, I see my husband and baby there, just checking if he's crying. No. Um, mummy alarm. Okay. So um, sometimes when I went to conference panels, especially in international relations, where you have a lot of qualitative researchers or researchers who are not used to sharing their data, they might say things like, well, isn't this like replication police and shouldn't, should student, students really start their career by being, you know, by not trusting other researchers and is this really a way to go about it, um, to go about research by being so distrustful? Um, so basically they would say, well, maybe replicators want to find errors because then they can say something didn't replicate and publish and to have a scandal that goes to the newspapers. I personally never had any students who wanted a replication not to work out. Whenever my students couldn't get the same table, they always thought they did something wrong. They always thought maybe I was incompetent, uh, I'm just an amateur, I'm sure this great professor from whatever university must know better. And um, they really wanted to get, they wanted to confirm the paper. They felt it was more successful for them. Um, when they could confirm it. And so I found that argument really ridiculous. It, 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 people who are replicators are not, you know, replication police trying to be bullies. I think they're just really interested in a certain study. And um, I think it would be great if I could confirm something. Um, but then you have to do, definitely have to do extra work to make a paper out of it. And I've confirmed uh, studies as well. Um, uh, I asked an author um, from, from the American University um, if he could send me his data because he worked on human rights as well and I wanted to learn. He applied a certain thing that I didn't know how it works statistically, so he sent me his code, he sent me everything, and I redid what he did in Stata, I did it in R, it all worked out fine. I actually didn't take it any further, um, but what happened was that he invited me to become a visiting scholar with him at some point. And so great, right? I don't have a paper out of it, but I don't actually care because I might to, you know, I might get to, uh, to work with him in the future. So we don't always need negative uh, um, examples. Right, so back to your question. There are journals that are open to replications. I haven't seen a journal yet that is specifically for replication studies. But if someone has come across something, um, because these things develop really fast, um, so far I haven't seen it yet. I think it would be a great idea. But there are a lot of journals that are open to replications. So in political science, this is when you download the slides, you can, you can see um, actually research in politics. This journal here is relatively new, and they have actually said we actively invite replications. And replications have been published in all kinds of journals in all kinds of fields. So it is definitely possible. And uh, these are just examples, and I'm sure there are more. And these little thingies here just show you sometimes you want to send your um, replication study to the same journal that published the original, because that is where the kind of engagement will take place, that forum. Um, <coughs> some journals ha sometimes have a special issue dedicating to inviting replication studies for that particular journal uh, um, um, issue. Um, and so that you kind of have to look around in your field. Yeah? Uh, there's one for e JAXA, the Journal of Economic Science Association. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'll send it to you. But it, yep. It's similar to research and politics in that mm -hmm. it's one of, in their like, mission statement, one of the things is that they actively are soliciting. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so in Econ, there is a new journal that also invites 
replications actively. What is the name again? Uh, Journal of the Economic Science Association. Journal of Economic Science Association. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure those people from Econ know the know the journal. Yeah. So uh, another motivating thing: um, early career researchers can get published with replications. These are all uh, people who have done that. Some of them are my own students. I can't actually read my own slide because. <laughs> Um, so, this is a student of mine, and one of the others is a student of mine. So, it is definitely possible, either as a working paper on maybe on your lab website, uh, or as a journal article, so it is possible to get something out of it. I had a few students who turned their replication uh, project into a chapter within their PhD, as a kind of motivating um, exercise to then go further into whatever they did it, whatever they did with their own analysis later. So there are different ways to use and reuse this replication exercise uh, other than publishing papers. Um, all of the things I've said so far are in this paper that I've uh, published um, with a lot of, of tips and hands-on tips and, and, and little steps that you can do and, and stuff like that. How much time do we have left? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Do we have any more questions about replication? How to replicate? Why is it worth it? Yeah. I was just going to ask for your students who um, did replication and then published from it. Did you, did they openly say that that's what they were going to do? Like, because you mentioned before that you tell your students to be polite and say, I'm just doing this for training purposes. Mm -hmm. But if they go ahead and publish afterwards, mm -hmm. then that's a bit. Risk hmm. like um, yeah, so the question is when, when you write to an author and say, I only want to replicate your study for a class project, but I'm not, I don't mean to kind of double check you and get published, but later you do get published, isn't that a bit unfair? Um, I don't know anymore what the students had written in their first email. Um, hopefully they were vague enough to not rule out that this would be published. Most of my students have actually been in touch with the authors in the process of writing that paper. And none of the students actually said, I found a failed replication and this author is awful and here is how to do it better. Most students kind of wrote it in a very neutral way of, this is where I started off, um, this is how I added knowledge, um, and wrote their own paper. So I, I have a very, none of the students have told me that the original author got back to them saying, hey, you lied to me. But um, it depends, yeah, it, it depends on kind of, it's really a very personal thing on how you communicate with other authors. And remember, these are researchers in your field, so you want, this should be a positive exchange, especially if you're uh, still a student or early career researcher, um, you, you want to be, you want to be careful, right? Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah? Yeah, you earlier said you need to pay much attention when, uh, while repeating. Is there a way to evaluate what you have written that is easily known that maybe you went wrong? Because you may be replicating, then you leave out a hypothesis, and then you have different results. So is there a way of evaluating the replication? Is there a way of evaluating a replication? Well, I mean, ideally the replication would lay out very clearly maybe even in an app a more technical appendix, showing exactly how they followed the steps of the author and what the difference was in the results. And then in the second bit, how they added knowledge and how that changed the results. So if I then want to say, is this a re good replication study or not, this would help me to judge how well the replication was done itself. Um, I don't really have a, another answer other than if I'm a researcher, I have certain standards of how I think a good study is done, and that for me applies to replication studies as well. With the addition that they have to be extremely clear on what they did differently and how that changed the results. Um, but otherwise, I would, if I had to judge a replication study, um, and I did for the student assignments, um, I would look for the same stuff that I look for in, a, in another paper. Good methodology, knowing what they are doing, um, citing sources, you know, doing their job properly. I have a, I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. If uh, 
I was a reviewer mm -hmm. in uh, reviewing papers in litigating journals. Mm -hmm. I will publish a paper which is uh, which is not written with the first author mm -hmm. because you may likely leave some other things. I will publish a paper you are replicating with the original author, mm -hmm. meaning that you have time to discuss with him about mm -hmm. certain things that have been. Yeah, you could try that. So. It could be a nice way to build a relationship if you use, uh, you know, nice professional language and you approach a person in a certain way. You may be able to publish a new, a new um, study with the original author that started as a replication project. Why not, right? That would be fantastic. I mean, that's what everyone wants. Find new collaborators and be positive rather than finding errors, you know? Good point. Okay, so the last bit, working reproducibly yourself. Obviously, if you are replicating someone else, you have to be very clear in what you are doing and very transparent. Now, I'm not going to get through all the slides, but the main message is, um, well, okay, actually, yeah, the main message is you don't want to be the, a dummy, okay? So, you don't want to be this student who had to fight against uh, uh, people who were trying to rob them in the street you know, the, the general uh, advice from the police is give them what they want and walk away safely. Okay, so the student really um, did not want to give their backpack because the hard drive in the bag was the only copy of the work and the data. You don't, you don't want to be that person. You also don't want to be this person. Laptop lost on the bus, right? Crucial scientific data lost. This is why you upload your data to a repository, even if you if you block them for a few years because you want to still work with them. So this was Imperial College in London. This, you know, this is here. <laughs> you don't want to be that person either. Lost backpack. Um, that was in a pub in Cambridge uh, where I live. Uh, it contains a laptop, a hard drive, and scientific document. Very important, five years of research crucial for my PhD thesis, okay? So when you work transparently, that usually means your data are not just in a fiddly file somewhere on your hard drive. Your data are hopefully on OSF, GitHub, or all the tools that you will learn or have learned already. Um, they are safe for you um, and for others later at some point. For now, you can block them so that only you can see them. You don't want to be these people. That is, that is my main message why you should uh, work reproducibly. And um, there are other reasons, <clears throat> I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but your data could be cited. This is often the case now that the, a data set is cited as itself. Um, you want to build a good reput reputation as a transparent researcher. This is an important point. Last time I uploaded my own data for my paper and my code and all the stuff you should upload to Dataverse, I was a little bit nervous because I thought, okay, now I've been writing my blog about replication, what if someone comes and finds that my study is complete rubbish? But, so the way I calmed myself down was, well, I might make errors, I might have made errors, I'm sure I did because I'm human, but at least I was transparent and I didn't try to hide anything. So if someone tries to replicate my study and they find that something doesn't really work out, no one can say she withheld data and she was being secretive, maybe she did something dodgy. I can always say I was transparent and yes, I'm a human researcher who does errors. So I felt this actually kind of, it was a bit of a relief to, 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 um, to approach it like that. And so if you have a reputation as a transparent researcher, even if you do errors, it may not do you that much harm, basically. Okay, consistency. I've reused data from, from my first PhD chapter in a paper three years later. I found it very difficult to make sense of what I did back then. Um, or if you have a collaborator or you work off the work of someone else's, um, uh, like another postdoc in your lab, um, consistency uh, is really only possible if everyone is really transparent. <clears throat> Plus it's good for science, but I really want you to know why working transparently is good for you, right? So this is something that you will learn throughout the summer school, just a few pointers, how to work transparently, they have really, in my opinion, four, four big uh, steps. One is to have a proper file structure. Two is to comment your code so that another person can understand what you did. Don't just code your, your commands. Do say what you did. Have a clear method section in your paper or maybe 
have a longer method section as an appendix if the method section in the paper is, doesn't allow for enough space to say exactly what you did and how. And obviously sharing your materials on one of the online platforms. So the file structure, um, I like to use templates, the same structure for every project. I never change original data. When I download a data set, say from the World Bank, this is saved in a folder called raw data and I never touch it. I never open it in Excel and change something by hand. It gets loaded into R and then I work and rework with the data. So, do you think this is a good way? Okay, obviously not, right? So, this is how it does look, unfortunately, uh, on my computer, but not more recently, okay? So, more recently, it looks a little bit more like this. This is what the tier protocol um, recommends. Um, so just Google project tier. So they say, ideally, you have four folders and subfolders. One is for the original data. One is for documents, your paper, your appendix. One is for the command files, data code, SPSS syntax, R script. And one is for analysis data. This is the data that basically, after you've transformed the original data, this is where those go. This is totally up to you. You could also follow the advice, thank you, from Christopher Gantrud, who wrote a whole book about how to work reproducibly in R and R Studio. Um, he has a very similar structure. Say there's this project, it's called Nicole's Human Rights Project, and here you have the analysis, here you have the data, here you have the R code, how you merged your data, um, here you have the R code for the analysis. So there are different ways to structure it, and if you find a good way for you, then try and stick with it. Because if you then later have to share your data with others, it'll, or with yourself after five years, if you want to revisit your project, it'll be so much easier. Comment your code. That sounds banal, but really comment everything you're doing. Everything. Loading data, this is something you can comment, and I would recommend it, because not everyone knows how to load data in, in all the different softwares, right? Merging tables, creating figures, write, write more than you really want to write, okay? And what I do, I ask usually um, colleagues, or I used to actually pay someone, can you please rerun my code and see if you get the same tables, and only then will I upload the data. To the dataverse. And I've done it with two students and they did find errors because I had updated my R script without saving it or something and one table was duplicated instead of getting a second table with different results. And they saved me from big embarrassment. So if you can find a buddy who, help, who helps you just running through your code, uh, that would be fantastic. So this is from one of my class assignments. Do you think this is a good code or a bad code? Yeah, so in my logistics class, I told students if you want to get a good grade, you have to send me a reproducibility appendix where you comment your code. One student sent this, and I downgraded him. I'm, I'm, I'm really tough. <laughs> because I did tell them like 10 times. So this student did it much better, right? So at least here, you can see this is data. Explore data, stage one, preparing data, and then here he... He even wrote something for himself. Oh, I did this, I did that, da 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 da. Right? So this is much better, this is much easier. Or this code, um, you can, if, this is an R, right? So you can say, I'm loading this data. These are the main models. This is my correlation matrix. This is the best version of it. This is how I did it. This is not perfect. That's my own paper. Ideally, and th this is something you can learn here. You would work in R, but you use something like, for example, R Markdown or Knitter or something, where um, you write your R code here, but then you click Compile PDF, and it'll, it's unfortunate that this does, comes out so pixely, but um, this can create a PDF with really nice text and headlines and code chunks in between. And this is just perfect. Um, and this is something to really look into. Uh, if you work with R Studio or R, um, you can um, you can just look for R Markdown, for example. Um, that is something that is really nice and neat. So just to be clear, that's not like the, the, the paper output. That's like a sort of a side effect of running the code. Between yeah. Okay. So this is basically your code, but with comments in a nice PDF file and pretty fonts and nice colors.
And I'm telling you, I've worked off this kind of code from other people. This is so much nicer. Um, so, different things you can do with that. Um, I upload this usually when uh, my last paper, the uh, editor said, we will only accept the paper formally once you've uploaded this <clears throat> to Dataverse and sent me the URL. So I uploaded this, plus the original R file as well, just, you know. Um, I uploaded the data, I uploaded a readme file, and so this is something that belongs into your replication materials. You can actually also add it as an appendix when you submit your paper for the peer reviewers if you want to be um, super correct. Um, my husband has done that. He uh, actually sent the data and the code and the reviewer said, mm, I don't quite trust it. And he said, go to line so-and-so and rerun the code and look at the figure. And the reviewer did that and was persuaded and that's how the paper got through. That, obviously, that's a best case scenario. So the rest of this stuff I'll leave to you. There are other things that are all written out in the slides. Um, replication notes, these are all the different things you can do. This is a variable, variable code book, very important. These are the different data sharing platforms. This is stuff you can just read at home. It's, uh, it's very self-explanatory. Thank you. Mm -hmm.